just to to give you a little bit of a background how how I came actually to this webinar and suddenly was asked uh, saying something about uh, the the well-being of of the trainers and I was like hmm, what can I say and then I said well something there is a lot of things to talk about which is health which is uh, conflict management which is about um, self uh, self presentation and so on and so on but. There is also another thing that was always a little bit uh, bothering me, to be honest, uh, which is about um, colleagues. Uh, the, the the fact that I'm missing colleagues in the other life in which I am I have started working in, which is related to let's say uh, um, development cooperation and international work that has a focus on young people, but at the same time it is not under the framework of Erasmus+. Plus. While I see very often colleagues from uh, dealing with youth and youth work are mainly working under the framework of Erasmus+, Plus, and I would like to attract you actually to, to, to come to this area too, because this is really um, an issue. I see a lots of very, very fantastic experts around in, in the framework of what I'm doing, but I'm missing a lot those people who have particular skills, particular capacities that uh, are so necessary when you work with young people, when you work with civil, civil society, when you work with, with uh, different type of groups which are very diverse. And very often I see that those experts who are thematically probably wonderful and really, really great people have no idea how to deal with these people. And that that leads to a lots of uh, difficulties and and uh, let's uh, failures I would say also, and in the end also to to some sort of a collapse of the project, because uh, there will be a lots of conflicts in the end. There will be a lots of misunderstandings in the end, and so on and so on. Depending, no matter if it is, if we are talking about trainings and um, or we are talking about. Um, management of, of larger teams or involvement and collaboration with larger teams. And I have a huge confidence that actually when I'm talking about uh, working with people with Erasmus Plus background, um, that they have a much better understanding of how to deal with such kind of partly very, very tense um context and, and and situations from a geographical perspective, cultural perspective, or also other perspectives. Just to be, to, just to give you one very simple example is uh, when I was working once in Turkey and uh, under the framework of a larger, um, larger development program on uh, engaging with um, civil society, with, with public officials to understand what civil society is and how to deal with civil society organizations. We had a large training on uh, large training um, for um, public officials of around 5,000 of them. And we, um, I looked really for whoever has Erasmus Plus background, whoever has anything, any understanding or of, of, of non-formal education, because that was exactly what was needed and no one wanted to see all those presenters anymore who are just coming there and having probably something like a PowerPoint, what I'm going to do, unfortunately, in the next few minutes, uh, and, and have no idea about how to interact, how to energize, how to bring these people together. And then, because I have seen that before, and then I re really tried to change the whole thing because it didn't work. It simply didn't work. People were coming, uh, listening, clapping, going, and there was not even a feedback after that. While when when you used uh, non-formal educational um, methodologies and, and other kind of uh, reflection activities and so on and so on, that was really interesting to them. That really made them uh, motivated and also to me also, it had a bigger impact, definitely. So I would like just to tell you a little bit. So first of all, this whole presentation is about to give you a little bit of an understanding of what else is existing behind Erasmus Plus, uh, based on the example that is me, myself. So 
this is um, I I believe there are lots of other opportunities, of course, existing, and you will hear about those opportunities during this presentation as well. But I will focus mainly on those opportunities that I am usually working on and trying to get new assignments for from. So uh, let me share with you now my presentation. What I'm doing currently, I'm, I'm working at the moment. I call myself freelance consultant and trainer, and um, I have a specialization, let's say, um, that I have been really very, very strongly working on, uh, on youth, youth policies, civil society, civil society context, and also with regard to public, civil society public uh, collaboration on human rights, on aid effectiveness. In this framework, I'm doing a lot of evaluation activities also and public policies in general, but with particular focus on um, young people with disadvantages. And uh, I have started my working in this in, in the framework of youth as a, as a volunteer uh, back in the 90s, in the beginning of the 90s. And I was very much involved in a kind of um, uh, organization in uh, located in based in Bonn in Germany that was uh, doing Turkish and German student exchanges. And we had a particular focus on um, making um, the, the, yeah, working on the tensions back then that were, uh, that have started in the nineties, in the beginning of the nineties on the uh, following the racist attacks in Germany. In, 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 and we wanted to make sure that young people from Turkey and from Germany do have a better understanding about each other, learning from each other, and also discussing and talking with each other. And in this respect, also, uh, we had organized uh, lots of youth exchanges back then. It was before, of course, um, EU for Youth as such. So the youth exchanges that we were organizing very much were funded by the German government back then and also some other um, private institutions and uh, focusing on democratic culture and on study visits and, and, and making some trainings around the different topics uh, related to democratic culture and also understanding of democracy, but also a little bit the issue of Turkish uh, accession was also to the EU was also playing a big role. Uh, the, the whole thing uh, changed in a little bit. Starting from 1996, we got the first European funded project that was under the EU for uh, Youth for Europe back then. And uh, the focus was mainly on the EU accession of Southeast Europe, but uh, that included also Turkey, Greece, um, 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 Romania, Bulgaria back then. And these countries were also uh, back then called somehow, or there was a very clear, unclear uh, definition whether these are Balkan countries or not Balkan countries and so on and so on. However, in our project back then, we were uh, connecting them all or, or defining them all under the Balkan context. Um, for later in the around 20, uh, uh, around 2000, I became the director of the organization and worked around four years more in this organization until I made a very, very large cut in, in, in my career and started to say, okay, I learned enough, uh, it's enough for me. I don't want to uh, be anymore in an organization. I'm getting older, the younger generation should follow. And uh, I will now become a serious trainer. And I had no idea really about the training aspect and the training environment. I did, uh, I went to a lot of training myself. I was also doing, of course, during the time when I was in the organization doing some trainings, but I was not really learned, someone who has learned to be a trainer. I think I got, this learning very much during the time I was working with colleagues. And I learned a lot from colleagues in, in a way during the time I was doing the training. And um, and however, I called myself always a second generation trainer. So second generation trainer because I was coming from the field and um, from, the, from the youth context and was doing and working with young people myself. So, and um, doing here and there, trying out different kind of trainings. And the good thing here in, in this framework was that I could specialize. I could specialize a lot on issues that were 
um, mostly interesting to me. So human rights, disadvantaged young people, youth policies, NGO management, and fundraising. So a little bit also connecting the topics with also things that I was doing uh, since uh, around 1992 onwards. So. I try to, to to combine everything that I was learning and doing in in my in my uh, NGO um, work with with the trainings that I was then uh, delivering later on, and I believe it worked very well because I'm a, someone who is going giving trainings by 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 giving examples of what I have been uh, seeing myself and not creating something new, and I still keep doing that, and this is very interesting because. Uh, I believe that um, that this is um, the, the the fact that you have a lots of examples of 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 real situations is very much appreciated by those people who are joining the trainings. And the regional focus has developed itself more or less also through the work that I was doing before in the Balkans, Turkey, and so on. And the Eastern Partnership countries were coming in into it because I started working with Salto, Salto, Eastern Part uh, Eastern Europe, and Caucasus, and then in that regard, also working with another uh, Viennese organization that also had a lots of focus on Eastern Partnership countries. So this is how the 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 the, the whole region also have um, been developed in my case. I'm, I'm actually underlining this importance very much that you need a kind of specialization. You, the, um, I see that in the field of, of training, very often uh, colleagues are, of course, um, in need of money, in need of uh, support. And in some cases, they do everything. They just focus, uh, OK, there is something about uh, management. OK, maybe I have some. Let's do that. There is something about possibility for uh, um, entrepreneurship. Ah, okay, that sounds interesting. Let's uh, let's try to find out something about it, and then let's do that. I see also a lot of trainers. Um, I mean, I have nothing against that. This is good. This is fine. It's about a lot of learning behind that, and it is very useful. But there is a moment when you have to start. I believe to focus and to specialize yourself. Otherwise, when you are sharing and giving your CV to, to someone outside, they just go through it and they cannot find you. They, I mean, there is a word in German, it says you cannot see the tree because of, of the forest. So there is a, this is, this is a, this is, this would be also the issue with regard to your CV. If you have in your CV a lot of, lots of, lots of very, very different things, then, um, then it will be very difficult for the person who is assessing your CV in the end uh, to to find actually who you are, what what you can really do. And I will come to that point a little bit later. So <clears throat> during these training activities and these, during this training experience, what I have, what I believe I have got uh, that is very important and very used and very wanted. By those um, by those people who are hiring me currently, is definitely first of all the non-formal learning techniques in the context of uh, trainings that I'm providing, either be it in I don't know somewhere in the Pacific or somewhere in Africa, or somewhere uh, wherever I'm working. The non-formal learning techniques are extremely. Sometimes they use the word sexy, so because you really can catch the people. You really can get them out because you get participants coming to the room. They are bored. They are expecting that someone is coming again and speaking for, for, for hours and hours. The whole day will be just a presentation. And then they have to go again because they have been sent by someone to listen to. And the non-formal techniques really make it possible that within just an hour, if, if not two, you really have a group that is interested, motivated, and really want to do and get something out of this day. Because they really, yeah, they they, they are there anyway. Very often they are not coming. Uh, they are not coming because they have been uh, motivated or, or voluntarily uh, thinking, ah, this is interesting for me. No, they are coming because of many, many other reasons. And sometimes they are sent, sometimes they believe, uh, they totally mix up. They believe that they are coming to those trainings because there is money. 
and they will get money for the projects in the end uh, as, a, as a kind of recognition of, the, of being in that training and so on and so on. However, non-formal education is, is, is the key sometimes. Knowledge about project management and coordination. I mean, I am listing here down things that where you can find yourself immediately. I'm, I, I'm quite sure. And this is also very interesting to me when I was thinking about what are actually those things on those issues that I believe have been actually contributing to the success I had in the in the framework of uh, external um, the, in terms of in, in the framework of tenders which are related to external uh, EU's external support and uh, especially with regard to collaboration with the uh, DG INTPA and DG NIR and all the other institutions um, uh, related to that. Intercultural communication and teamwork, yes, indeed. I mean, this is something you all are very much aware about. You know how to deal with this. You have actually very intense, very deepened information about what what this is because you need that. You definitely need that. I mentioned that to you. You are coming suddenly in a completely new context, and um, and and and. Not only you are different, but the people who are there are different, and the people who are there are different in the, in their own in a way that you it is not known to you. So knowledge about intercultural communication and teamwork is extremely important, and having the experience in this framework is extremely important to make sure that you can manage um, you can manage a team or working with a team in the shortest possible time. And making sure the work is intensive, the work is impactful, and the work is uh, is also interesting at the same time. Application writing and EU funding understanding. This is this is also something that you can definitely find yourself very clear in that. And to be honest, when I uh, when I am thinking right now about writing an application. A tender, let's say, or contributing to a larger tender of three or six million, I do not see a big difference between what I'm writing in 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 uh, under the Erasmus Plus um, Action Two or or uh, strategic uh, corporations and so on, or probably even not in the previous ones that we were writing for youth exchanges and trainings. The concept is the same. They're just the the amount is different, and the 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 I would say the um, yeah there is there is a let's say the, the size is bigger. However, the concept of of those applications are more or less the same. They are all mostly based on this logic of of the so-called logical framework, and uh, even if you are not probably familiar with logical framework now, but once you have heard about it and you look a little bit into internet and you find out, oh, this is actually exactly the same what you what I was writing in 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 my in my application so far. Because it's just a logic. And then facilitating collaborative learning and group dynamics, of course, is very necessary and very helpful, as I already mentioned. Um, People who are coming to those kind of trainings and capacity building activities, they just don't want to get bored. They really would like to collaborate. They want to be taken serious. They want to be taken, their experience should be taken serious. And uh, there shouldn't be a, 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 a trainer or a teacher in front of them telling them what to do, but they really would like that someone is asking them what to do because they are there, there. They are there, the knowledge is there, and they really would like that also to share it. Then being sensitive towards cultural differences, of course, being effective and being an effective monitor and doing effective monitoring and reporting. And these are also uh, activities that you are very much aware about. And, um, and again, the monitoring and reporting in the framework of a bigger project is not much different than what we you what we know how it is done under the framework of Cosmos Plus. Uh, so I got my first EU tender in 2010. It was um, a, a role of a junior expert, and um, I was in charge of uh, together with the team leader of mine 
um, working and traveling around the Eastern Partnership countries and uh, doing an analysis on youth needs and support in the Eastern Partnership region. And the whole thing has led to the opening of the youth window in the end, this 35 million uh, magic uh, program in the end and technical assistance project EPIRU that was um, Eastern Partnership uh, Regional Unit project that uh, came after that. So I was very, wow, okay, you really can do something else. You can also, you can come from the field and you can, you have uh, enough knowledge and experience that can even lead to this kind of decisions in the end. So I was very kind of uh, in German, uh, taking uh, how we, in German we say, uh, I licked blood and then I wanted to continue and I found it very interesting. So I continued and then they, so they opened the, 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 the door got opened at, um, and still is open, thank God. And I'm working very much directly now with a lots of uh, within the lots of projects uh, that are uh, supporting DG Inpa, DG Near, the World Bank, UNDP, Danida, British Council, and some other um, some other donors um, here and there. Um, currently, I'm, I'm team leader as a EU for Youth Coordination and Policy Support. We are trying to. Um, do the coordination between different projects uh, and support activities in the framework of uh, uh, supporting young people in the Eastern Partnership, and um, and also providing policy support to to different stakeholders, including the the, the, the uh, EU Commission. Then uh, I'm doing uh, I'm just closing the evaluation of a civil society support activity in the Balkans, and uh, and uh, have just. So I finished another training in of for civil society organizations in Timor Leste on EU funding, on EU funding, and uh, with particular focus on youth. So that is um, that is of course again you can see a lot of parallels here. Where do I have where where do I bring my experience? I bring my experience only from uh, mainly from Erasmus Plus and the EU for youth in the past. So. Uh, all the stories that I'm telling them and so on comes from you, comes from Erasmus Plus very often. And, and it is appreciated. It is definitely appreciated. It is very much wanted. And uh, so, for example, in Timor Leste, I was invited even twice for because they really liked it. The OSC civil society organization said this is the first time they have seen something like that. I didn't do magic. I just worked on non formal education and I just do five more energizers probably and also teamwork and reflection activities and so on and they really got it as a as a completely new approach for them because they never saw it like this before so i really i'm i'm not I'm exaggerating this this is this is simply like uh, as it is there are lots of other experts who are just doing it differently and sometimes also that leads to lots of misunderstandings and problems I will not now tell you what I have I was doing in the past in the framework, but generally very often trainings, policy analysis, and other analysis activities, but also management activities. Things that you also do with your organizations and within your organizations, and you have all been involved in, in writing as some sort of analysis document and um, preparations of, of reports and preparation of uh, um, um, yeah uh, background information for 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 your activities this is all very very similar to in the way how they are done very very similar to what we have been or we are used to work on during the Erasmus plus so how to do that um, Erasmus Plus is more or less um, a very, very friendly environment. Uh, lots of very friendly people, lots of very friendly organizations, mainly the NGOs. Sometimes also we have, of course, the uh, um, uh, the, the, the national agencies, but they are also very friendly people. I see here Rita, uh, just not to... Yeah, say something wrong. 
And um, no, they are. The, everyone is very friendly and very nice and very very helpful. And and you can make a lot of mistakes. Also, you learn from those mistakes. And this is very important to have this environment. Also, of course, you cannot do very, very serious mistakes that, that is clear, but still you are always helped and supported by by your colleagues. And by, also by, by, not only by the colleagues, but also by whoever and how uh, whoever is uh, uh, giving you this assignment to do. And here, here comes the big difference. Tenders are competitive, business oriented, and much different from the NGOs and from governments especially. Tenders are pure business. These implementers are mostly not NGOs, they are companies, simple companies that are interested in, in financial profit. That's something you should not forget because very often I have situations when someone is saying, oh, Belarus, this is too expensive. Is it my problem? No, this is the company's problem. They have to deal with this because this is company's problem and this is a business situation. If the company would like to have it like this, then it is like this. Then, then because the companies have this other approach, they are service oriented. They are providing a service that they are requested to do. Someone, if you are hiring a person and would like to have the person cleaning your windows, then you are, first of all, you would like to know what kind of reputation they have. Are the cleaning windows well? What? How much does it cost? And and uh, the person who is coming is having a sort of uh, experience in cleaning windows, yes or no? So, if you really would like to have your key window cleaned perfectly well, so this is exactly how the 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 those organizations institutions are also looking into that, and this is also the approach the companies have. The companies want to, of course, to provide the best quality, but uh, need to also negotiate the price in a way that the, the, they are getting the grant in the end. No, not the grant, sorry, the tender. Again, it's not the grant, it's a tender. And it's uh, and the environment is main mode, the work environment is based on deliverables, contracts, and following the contract rules, and there is much more less flexibility in terms of, uh, yeah, in any term, in terms of changing the terms of reference, in, in terms of uh, um, um, uh, in, 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 in bigger, in bigger uh, formats uh, of change. So when I'm talking about change, you can do a lot of uh, flex. You have a lot of flexibility. Is doing a change during the activities, during the implementation, but you will not be able to to go for a bigger change and say this this project is shit. This is not working in the end because this is exactly what the company is ex expected to do, and the company has agreed to do that and hired you to do that. So you have to do that. Uh, if Entry are asking me, yeah, all these companies are coming and they would like to do something and they have no idea about the sector. They do have no idea about uh, the youth or the, the the gender issues and why why is a, a Anson Young company is doing something in the Eastern Partnership countries? Because it's not about them. They are just managers. They are just managers. And who is actually implementing? It is you. It's about the people, the experts who are in this team and who are doing and implementing the project. The, 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 the company is just, uh, yeah, it's, your, it's just your employee, em, employer. And it's, this, in that regard, it is much, much different than when you are working in the framework of an NGO and a grant or when you're working together with one of those wonderful, great, full, partners and, and SALTO people and, uh, and uh, national agencies and so on and so on. And also when it comes to the selection area, there is a um, selection criteria. I will tell you a little bit more about that, uh, but it is very important to know that um, the selection is mainly and mostly and actually um, 
without almost no exception, is based on your CV. Dot. There is no other thing. Don't even don't even think about writing a motivation letter or this and that. There is no cover letter needed. Only your CV. Your CV need is the the key to this kind of uh, opportunities. No one wants to know what why you want to be. They want to learn that whether you fit to the job or not through reading your CV. There is only uh, even no interviews. So I have rarely had an interview. I sometimes have an interview with a company. And even sometimes the companies don't have an interview with you. They just take you based on the CV. They propose you based on the CV. And then once the, your, their proposal is approved, you still didn't talk to any person before that until the kickoff. And then the kickoff is happening. And then this is the first moment you are seeing these people. And also, and that makes also, again, how important it is to have a well-structured, keyword-rich CV. Keyword-rich, what does it mean? It means have in mind that those people who are reading your CV have no idea about the topic. Just, I don't want to uh, underestimate the role of, 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 of all those important assessors, but sometimes I have the situation, it's not sometimes, it's very often, uh, considering the names and the phone numbers of those people who are con communicating for, with me uh, after the pre-selection pre of my CV. These are usually young graduates who are sitting somewhere in Central Asia and uh, looking into your CV and doing the pre-selection. If they are not convinced that you are fitting to the job, then you will not be able to pass the next. So that is very important to consider when you are, when I'm talking about keyword reach, that means you have to look into your terms of reference that is sent to you. And the terms of reference includes a lot of very important reach keywords, keywords that you have to translate yourself from your Erasmus Plus ex, uh, expertise. If you are using words that are not included in the terms of reference, then they don't understand what you're talking about. What is actually, you know, when they are saying interactive uh, interactive training uh, experience. But you are not you're going to use interactive training experience. You are saying, I don't know, non-formal learning methods. They have no idea how to translate that. They don't know what it is. And they are not having the time to check that. So be aware that your CV has to be always clearly translated into what the terms of reference requires. Doesn't mean you should change your, you should lie or you should change your, your CV in a way that, that it is nice and looking or whatever. Just translate, translate what is written in the terms of reference into what is actually your experience. Short term service. The long term assistant, uh, technical assistant projects, these are services requested usually by the European Commission, by the EU delegation, or other governmental institutions. And this um, can be, I don't know, Georgian government is uh, would like to do a reform on something. Uh, can be anything starting from road construction uh, law or or youth law or I don't know public law on 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 housing or I don't know what and they are asking then the European Commission uh, whether they would like to support them in this respect to buy to a to a technical assistant uh, service that is then provided to that particular ministry probably that is in charge or the EUD would like to do something larger, is supporting, uh, I don't know, supporting um, um, employment and employability in Eswatini, for example. That is mainly then uh, an activity that is led by the EU delegation itself. 
Or the Genia would like to do something like an overview and, and supporting uh, young people in the eastern part of the countries. And uh, they, for this purpose, they are uh, establishing a new program and they would need then technical assistance in order to manage this project and program. So they usually take between one and five years, but, but typically between two and two and a half years recently. And they are usually composed of key and non-key experts. So key experts are those people who have um, usually, well, they are usually mainly two or three key experts in each project. And the rest are all non-key experts. So these three key experts are those who are taking full responsibility for the implementation of the project, including the team leader. Usually it is based on the team leader, uh, a thematic expert, and then depending on whether it's a communication project or it is a, a, a coordination project, then there is a coordination expert or a communication expert or some other type of expert, depending on the project, of course. Um, for the key experts, usually um, uh, all documents are needed. So every key expert has to have uh, a CV parallel to all proofs of documents that are uh, that that explain what is in the CV. So this is this is a very important point because that's uh, the, one of the that's the most challenging parts. You always have to run after all your proof documents because if you do not have those proof documents, you will not be able to put that point into your CV because there is no proof about it. And that is not easy because uh, you have done something 15 years ago. You even don't know who it was, but uh, you have to find it. <laughs> you have to find it. So I have to find a way how you can make a proof for this activity that you have done. And be, be very, very careful about fake documents. I'm sorry to say that. I, I do not believe that any of you would even think about it. But fake documents, they are calling. They will call. They are they are really wants to make sure that all documents are are real, especially those documents that may not look very real to them. So, another thing, uh, but for non-key experts in the framework of technical assistance services, you don't need proofs. You need a list, a clear, a good, and very well designed um, uh, CV. But uh, in this CV, you don't need the proofs to show because that's uh, simply technically very difficult to, to assess and to, to monitor in the end. Um, the same also for the short-term services. The short-term services, or uh, I will tell you a little bit more about that, uh, they also do not expect uh, proofs of documents, but mainly, um, mainly, um, your CV. The short-term services or so-called framework contracts, these framework contracts are usually about quick services that are requested by EU institutions. And the newest, uh, the newest let's say, round of um, framework contracts are uh, having this, this abbreviation of SEA 2023. If you say EU framework contracts SEA 2023, you will find a lot in the internet about it. A lot of companies, by the way, that are offering uh, jobs around this. This is a request that is coming uh, and they are, they are divided into around 15 lots at the moment, lots, different lots, each of them in another thematic area. By the way, lot 14 is new. It is about education, youth, and civil uh, education and youth and civil society, if I'm not mistaken. So there will be a lot of new framework contracts coming, focusing on young people, which is new, which is a little bit based on a work that I was doing together with Max Fras Paxton, if you know who this person is, that we were working on developing um, the EU Youth Action Plan. And the Youth Action Plan for External Services requires that there is more focus on young people in development cooperation. So based on that, this new lot was born. And a few other programs too. 
And then um, activities uh, are usually evaluation, capacity building, consultations, and more. Um, I will list down a little more later on. That. And they, 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 they can be around a few days and to maximum two years. But um, when I'm talking about days, um, and my, my shortest, let's say, framework contract was about 14 days. And I was uh, expected to go within these 14 days to do a full evaluation of the EU program uh, in Eswatini. And uh, so within these 14 days, preparing um, uh, preparing the, 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 the background information, preparing the uh, desk review, and then going to the country, doing some interviews, and then coming back and, and finishing my report. And actually, already in the country, giving the first uh, the first uh, feedback on the on the program. So very extensive and intense work uh, within just fourteen days. Sometimes you have more time, but these are also much larger projects for um, um, evaluation activities, for example, but also capacity building. Oh, okay, the shortest one was actually six days. I was going for six days to to. Uh, Timor Leste, and within these six days, I gave for four days uh, a training on civil society uh, for civil society organizations on EU funding. So Prague, Prague rules. What are Prague rules? Um, what are the the requirements of the EU Commission? What is what are the requirements of the EU Commission related to monitoring and evaluation of of grant activities and so on? I was not born with this information, of course. I have also had to read this and to 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 create something that is more understandable and uh, but also benefiting a lot from what I have learned when I was uh, doing my own applications in the framework of EA Erasmus plus and um, EU for you. Um, then, uh, the framework contract agreements uh, usually are um, agreements with a group of consortia uh, under each lot. So under each lot, there are, let's say, five, six consortia uh, composed of um, uh, composed of uh, no, sorry. Agreements with consortia, exactly and um, composed of uh, five, six consortiums. Uh, so five companies, six companies in each consortium. And um, they receive then in a kind of regular basis, the request, three of them re receives the request and um, one of them wins in the end. It's a very simple procedure. Typical areas of expertise which are needed are yeah, policy advice and institutional reform. And but that looks a very like a very big big thing, but policy advice can be uh, also related to uh, capacity building in the framework of policy uh, or capacity building in the framework of uh, organizational management and so on and so on. Then financial and economical an an analysis, uh, environmental and climate change. That's a very, very hot topic uh, nowadays. Unfortunately, I have no idea about this part. And that's why also I have no chance to get there. Um, public administration and public finance management, health and education, infrastructure and urban development, um, uh, legal expertise, information and communication technology. These are the main, let's say, uh, hot areas at the moment where where expertise is needed and wanted in the framework of both technical assistance projects, the long terms and the short terms as well. Uh, what are the key requirements of uh, of the experts? Yeah, of course, professional qualification and experience, especially usually university degree is a must. But if there is no university degree existing, then still additional work experience often counts. This is very important to, to note for those who have probably no master or whatever uh, or, or, or similar uh, university degrees. Sometimes it is written master, but, but still it says that if you do not have it, then still additional work experience in 10 years, five years, seven years or whatever is, 
is uh, is counting. Um, minimum of five to ten years because we are talking about junior and senior experts very often. And this is this is for key experts. What I'm here mentioning. Uh, we are having the junior experts usually starting from 10 years to five years, seven years. And the, the uh, senior expert starts with five years to 10 years. Usually it doesn't go over 10 years. There is no call that is asking for over 10 years. And they also mentioned that in their terms of reference clearly that if the expert has more than 10 years, it doesn't uh, make any difference anymore for us. So, but it does. Uh, in the end. And then specialized skills and knowledge, they really want to have experts. And that's why I was saying that it's so important that you specialize yourself, that your CV is actually clearly showing who you are and what is your background. So that's why, for example, I have introduced myself in the beginning that I have this focus on youth and civil society. I have this focus on project management and policy analysis. And I have this focus on Okay, the regional aspect is also playing a big role. So analysis, management, assessment, capacity building, familiarity with EU policies, regulations, and procedures. These are special skills and knowledge they want to know, but depends, of course, on the project itself. Sometimes it is special skills and knowledge in, I don't know, in health, in uh, in 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 ICT in um, uh, dealing with uh, people with disadvantages in uh, um, sometimes even much more uh, specialized skills like they only look for someone who has experience in uh, how is it called um, uh, who has a particular degree in, in for, okay, they cannot say a particular university, but particular degree. And it is not, it is then very, very specific and very difficult to find that person. So if you have that degree, then you have already good chances to get it. So in, in, in this regard, the terms of references of, are very, very different sometimes, depending on who is who has written them. And uh, there is no institution or no body that is writing the terms of references. The terms of references very often are written by the task managers themselves. So um, according to a certain guideline, but they have a lot of flexibility how and what to put there. Language proficiency, proficiency yes, English is, is the main language usually, however, uh, if the project is happening in a French country, French speaking country, or Portuguese or Spanish, uh, then these languages are requested as well. Sometimes it is a pre preferred, sometimes it is a must. So it depends very much on the terms of reference because they also consider sometimes related to the languages whether they would be ever able to find someone speaking Tetum which is um, which is a Timor Leste language, but having particular skills and capacities, and then they say, okay, then do it in English. Or in Libya, for example, um, they speak mostly English, and it is possible to provide trainings also in English language, and, and do not need to have Arabic skills in in the end. Analytical and communication skills, of course, that is very important in order in terms of uh, reporting and in terms of uh, making sure that uh, technical discussions are really happening in a in, in a in a uh, beneficial way for everyone, and uh, there is an understanding of uh, what is actually uh, decided. Um, then. We have uh, interpersonal and teamwork abilities, and of course, mobility and flexibility. And tell me now, who who does not find himself in this in this list? I think each of you can say, okay, that that this I can, this I can, this I can, this I can, and you can. And really, believe me or not, you can do that. This depends all how you are translating all this into your CVs. And. Um, and then, of course, later on, you have to see how you, uh, what kind of other requirements will be there, but there will be not much more required. Application process. Yeah, 
prepare your CV using the given template. Don't use another template, please. <laughs> I'm saying that to, very often to people, oh, can you send me your template? And then I'm getting a template that is completely self-made. No, those assessors are not interested in self-made templates that are with flowers and with nice things and with pictures and this and that and whatever. There is an original template existing, usually Europe 8 template it is called, and then you have just to follow that Europe 8 template. And uh, do not add something to it, do not change anything in it, because this is absolutely not wanted. The assessors uh, get totally actually angry <laughs> if you add something additional to it, because they really say, what do, why did you put this here and there? I have to delete, I have to find a way how to make it. And also very important is focus on the required criteria, use a simple language, do not complicate the CV too much, and uh, find the proof of the past jobs that you had, especially when you are asking for a key expert position role. And one more important thing is double check your CV that it is mistake free. Very important. Mistakes are kind of uh, uh, like a stone when when a person is reading and then what was that? And it already gives a bad impression. So don't do that. Make sure that your CVs are clean, readable, simple, not too, too artificial. I have done that also very often, this mistake, because I had no time. I just changed suddenly human rights to I don't know what's ever. And it, it looked so stupid what I have put there and no one actually ever responded to me in the end. Because uh, when you want to do and when you want to translate your CV into another word, into that what the terms of reference is asking, that requires some time and some understanding. And really you need to, to take your time reading the terms of reference and then to translate it accordingly. How much time do I have? Oh, okay. Then uh, CVs usually should be short, four to five pages. I know you have done much more trainings in your life and they, they fit into 15, 20 pages. The same with me as well, but four to five pages. It's very difficult to make that, but that takes you for maybe three days to make a very, very good one. And then in the end, you can use this as a base. For, for for all the other work that you, you do. Focus on the bigger jobs and more relevant jobs to the, what is written in terms of reference and leave the rest as a kind of, a, let's say, you have done trainings in this, in this, in this, in this, in this. Sometimes I have uh, clustered them under the same uh, job giver or under the same topic. So it depends how you would like to do that. And then you just mentioned you have done trainings from this year to this year, you have done this and doesn't like that. Ensure that CV is matches the terms. I cannot uh, stop repeating this. Obtain certificates, I already mentioned that. Be easy going in your communication, but clear and concise with the, with the, with the recruiters. Uh, they really like to be nicely treated because they really have a hard time. I, I know some of them meanwhile, and uh, we are in good relation by email and so on, even just for no reason. And it is um, majority of them I have never seen in my life, even not seen, but we are communicating via email. And the more nicer you are to them, the, the, the more often it can happen that they are sending you just, just like this, an offer like, Look, Perus, we have a one person has just dropped out of the team. Uh, are you not interested to take this and that role or this and that activity? Uh, this is very important as well. So offer your free availability to contribute to the tender document. That is, um, okay, some of my colleagues don't like this. They absolutely don't want to do that. I consider this as an important uh, step because I believe that to what I have been contributing to, I am also having a sort of ownership. 
and uh, I have an understanding of uh, what actually it would be when we win the project. Okay. Um, but um, it might be quite a lot of work. So you have to be aware how much work you can do, how many days you can offer. I sometimes say, okay, if you guys, you have your own tender writer, nice, uh, let it write. I will look over and I will make my revisions and comments and so on and so on. I will try to match because I am the expert that they are looking for, not the tender writer. The tender writer has no idea. It's just uh, writing a technical tender. That's it. And the rest related to the topic and all these things is, is really based on me and also the rest of the team that is going to be uh, hired. Now comes a more interesting part, so price negotiations. So um, when it comes, so now imagine uh, you have been pre-selected. That means you have been pre-selected by the company. There was, a, uh, there was a call and they are doing a pre-selection. Internal innovation. This is the moment when you have to write um, a statement of exclusivity and availability, making sure that you are available for 90 days uh, plus um, 40 days if they want to extend this offer because the commission did not find the time or for other reasons they could not uh, make a decision. This is for the long term projects and for the short term projects that is actually usually happening within two or three weeks. Um, make sure that that um, you are aware what is junior and what is a senior position. We are talking about this year, but sometime, if you are interested in the in the money, they and you are senior because you have more than seven years experience. It might be still interesting to uh, apply as a junior expert expert because the financial offer may go up to five hundred. Because otherwise, because the job is requesting only junior profiles, but um, but the but with you and with your CV, they would win it. So then, in that case, they would offer you more. This is depending on the company. So they have a very very large actually, uh, let's say negotiation uh, line, uh, starting from one hundred. I have seen that also uh, to maximum usually 500 for a junior expert. I could also sometime go around 600, something like that, but not so much into that direction, let's say, but um, only because it was clear with my CV, they would win it because you have to have also this kind of self-confidence. This is what Marisha taught us. In the previous, uh, in the previous um, um, webinar, and uh, with seniors, it starts with around three hundred, and then it goes somewhere. So, um, just um, just to have you a little bit of an understanding of how these budgets are put together, um, the the senior or junior positions uh, usually are. Um, all inclusive. That means um, when they are giving you 300, they probably have asked six or 700 from the commission. They give you 300 and the rest, part of it goes into their margins. And the other part goes for the uh, implementation of the project. For example, backstopping. Uh, uh, backstopping and office and so on and so on usually is paid by the expert fees. It's not an additional cost. No? Uh, and this and but the more interesting for them is the senior fee. So if the senior fee sometimes goes in in fact up to 1,200, 1,500, depending on what area and what project it is. It for for other projects like I don't know. Uh, economical issues might be even much more, but I'm talking mostly about civil society sector and so on and so on. So it goes up to 1,000, 1,200, 500, 500, but this is not what you are getting. That's for sure not, because they have to uh, they have to get 
um, part of it into your own pocket. They are benefit oriented, of course, business oriented. And on the second, uh, in in on on on, on second, um, on, on, on from the other side, uh, if the project uh, backstopping should be uh, financed by this. So you can negotiate starting from three hundred and then go some to land wherever you think is or wherever they think is necessary. They will pay more the more they believe that they are going to win with you. This is simple. Huh? That's um, it's a very simple logic here. They, there is no fixed sum. So most usually all experts in a project have different fees. So in my projects, I try to make it equal as much as possible. If I have any kind of say here, which I usually don't, but um, but but uh, every expert has another fee that has been negotiated. Sometimes it is also not bad to talk to some people who have some experience in fee negotiations if you have such kind of challenge and uh, maybe someone can give you a tip on what you can do. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the selection process is again based on your CV, the methodology that is written for the tender, and the financial offer. These three things play a big role in the entire uh, for the entire selection. On that basis, uh, the company is receiving the, the tender or not. And of course, the statement of exclusivity is important. Within when you sign the statement of exclusivity, you have to be aware that you cannot apply for any other job within the framework of this same project. If you do that, both companies will lose the project. That's very important. If your name appears in two projects under the same tender, the companies will be ineligible. So that's also very important to keep in mind. Uh, and they will get very angry at you <laughs> because of that. So that's also very important to keep in mind. And then we have, uh, yeah, the waiting time. Waiting time, as I said, two to three weeks. And that means also that you have to be very flexible. If you, if you apply for the framework contract, uh, it might be the case that within a month after the after the, the after the submission of the tender, you have to stop, and you have to be ready. So you calculate yourself uh, how many days uh, are given to you: twenty days, thirty days, eighty days, sixty days, one hundred twenty days, and how you are going to deal with that. Usually, it is manageable, uh, but but you should just be aware that. You cannot apply for this kind of jobs if you have a full-time job somewhere and you have absolutely no flexibility to change it or to, to deal with it somehow, to balance it or something like that. Yeah. Uh, this is it. <laughs> Thank you, Berus. <laughs> Some people already started to ask questions. Okay, very so nice. And I think one question you already answered, it was question from uh, Lyman, oh, sorry. It was question from Lymanus, and it was about what you were talking in the last couple of minutes. How do you deal with situation when several companies applying for the same service call and try to get your CV? Usually mm -hmm. it can be only in one company so first, right? And I think you answered this question that you should be in the one offer or? You should be only in one offer. Yes, you cannot. You cannot be in several offers at the same time. Also, not in different positions. It's impossible. That's okay. um, that. That is absolutely not seen uh, nicely, and also it's also not. Uh, it's not accepted by the commission. Okay. And the second part of the question is. And this uh, is very difficult because you have to make your decision in the end. With whom yeah. do I want to go? And then you really. Um, Sometimes it can really happen that you have five offers and they are really jumping at you and, and giving you, telling you all the stories like, we are the best, we have always been here and we have done this and that. Okay, 
but who are you exactly and with whom do I, am I going to work? If you can find uh, with whom you are going to work, that would be really a very, very good uh, possibility to, to make a direct, the right decision in the end, because you also don't want to have a terrible time in you. No. And that was another question. How do you assess the probability of the service providing consortium winning the call for service? How? Uh, first of all, I look into the into the into the company, what they are doing, whether they have any kind of particular um, experience in this regard. Who is part of the consortium? Usually, mm -hmm. I I'm asking these questions always. Sometimes they give me this information. Sometimes they don't give me this information because they are these are let's say hidden information. Let's say um, they they don't want to share that. It's let's say. Um, business secret, something mm -hmm. like this. Um, but but you know who is the, the main the main employer? And then you have to look into the regional aspect. Okay, how much experience do they have in Turkey, for example, if you are interested in a project on Turkey. If they never had a project in Turkey, um, it's already not a good sign. If, if they had a project in Turkey, then you have to find out who have been uh, beneficiaries and maybe it is a good idea to get into that information or trying to find some information. What kind of reputation do they have towards that beneficiary? That's also very important because that is also what the other beneficiary in Turkey is doing. They will call the others too and say, look, uh, what is your experience with this with this company? And of course, uh, this, this, this all play a role, but it is Sometimes it really a, a, Russish, a, a Russian roulette uh, game. You really don't know. Mm -hmm. And it can happen that you are losing. But OK, this is one to six. It's not one to 2,000 applications. It's one to six or so. But they... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, so. Yeah, to look also you as an expert now, you can look for the proofs of the companies that are participating. Like not only they evaluate you as an expert, but you also as an expert kind of evaluate with whom you are going to. Exactly, exactly. And you have to be, you have to be very straight in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when you feel that they really want you, then you have uh, more opportunities to ask questions. How do you feel? They send you a lot of emails. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they 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 really insist. Mm -hmm. They really insist. They they call you. They even call you. Mm. Once I got a call, and then she she said, "Yeah, um, uh, there is another company. What? Don't bother with them. They are not good. To <laughs> Come on, this is a... <laughs> so there is a competition. Okay, well, there, there is a there is a huge competition. They really <laughs> all all of them wants to win, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Then it was a question what about was uh -huh. Arthur. It was what your was question. Yeah. Uh, what was this assignment in Swaziland? You were in Swaziland. Yes. It's a new in South Africa. Yes. What? Where did you find this job? Well, that was a secret information. Uh no no no. It was a no. It was a it was a company. It was DAI. DAI, D-A-I, uh, is a consulting company, and they found my CV on LinkedIn. By the way, ah, I didn't mention LinkedIn. LinkedIn is your second gate to, to success. It's very important. They all look into LinkedIn. If they don't look, they have their, their, their CV database and everything, but LinkedIn is the place where they find and they fish the experts. So. Be aware that your LinkedIn profile is always up to date and also using the keywords. I sometimes even change the keywords because if I want to win a project, I key change the keywords on my LinkedIn profile according to the terms of reference that I'm actually waiting an answer for. So just to make sure that uh, okay. this is all fitting to each other. So Dai has asked me to um, to take take lead in that pro evaluation project. And I was working with a health expert and a, a financial expert. 
and it was about community involvement in uh, health sector. And my my role was looking into participatory approaches and how these participatory approaches at the village level uh, has uh, been successful and how it impacted actually the, the health situation in, in those villages around across um, Eswatini. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is how I got there. And then later on, I got um, another request uh, by uh, another, yeah, by, by IBF. IBF uh, has asked me, because it is written that I have been working in Swatini, that plays a big role again. And then they will asking me to provide training on uh, project management and fundraising, youth fundraising for civil society organizations. And the third assignment in Eswatini actually was based on that because they knew who I am. And then um, they mentioned something that there might be a new call coming on youth. So I was waiting for it. And then uh, and when, when, when it came out, uh, I just chose one of the companies that was fitting. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you, Behrouz. Uh, also, Artur had a question about the place where we can look for the tenders and uh, yes. some participants, they shared some, uh, some links to the um, European Commission tender uh, page. So if you yeah. can later... This, can... This, this, place is, this, this place is unfortunately not anymore so interesting. It mm -hmm. was interesting in the past. Uh, where you could see um, what kind of uh, announcements are made. Uh, and then you could make yourself ready a little bit. Like, And then at some point also you could see um, what kind of new projects are coming up. This page only shows this uh, randomly now as in a very limited uh, version. Um, while you can find the job opportunities by, um, okay, I will put I put I will put a list of com uh, companies together, and uh, that can be shared with you then later on, in in uh, via email, yeah, uh, who are actually offering kind of jobs. They have uh, the most famous ones are IBF, the AI. Uh, There are some names <laughs> that camera so becomes. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> different different companies are a lot of a lot of companies are involved in this. Mm. So. Thank you, Behrus. Environmental. And... You, you mentioned this are environmental experts. Yes. Uh, this is a subject that's uh, very interesting. For me yes, yes, now. definitely, definitely. There were there are calls for environmental issues a lot in in the recent time. So you mm -hmm. will find the calls on the website on the consultancies very often. And also, I recommend that uh, even though you might not be fitting very well to this particular project, still send your CV. So it is on their mm -hmm. on their table. They see your name. And then at mm -hmm. some point they may find it interesting and then they may come back to you. Mm -hmm. Keep on, uh, I, there, were, there, were, there was a time really 10 years ago, I was bombing them with my, with my, with my CV. Every second week I was uh, applying for something that I was like, really myself not sure whether I can do it or not. And then around 15 <laughs> years ago or something like that, there was a woman from Berlin, and we were also in touch uh, via email. And she said to me, Behrouz, I'm quite confident you can do all these jobs, absolutely. But your CV does not tell it to me. Your CV should look like you have done this the whole life. So that's why the specialization is so important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I will. Uh, we still have one more question. It's from... Mm -hmm. It's about based on your experience, if you've seen tenders open to key and non-key experts from or based in the global south. 
refer to third countries in the EU? Yes, 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 a lot. <laughs> if if I have seen them, yeah. or what is? I think the question is if they are there. <laughs> Yes, yes, uh, there are lots of uh, lots of tenders like this uh, based on the global stats. Yes, and they are looking always. I have, as I said, I don't speak Spanish, I don't speak uh, Portuguese, uh, I don't speak uh, French. But still, if I would speak these three or one of them, <laughs> then I would increase my capacities even more. But okay, I'm busy now. That's okay. good to know because that Spanish is useful. <laughs> yes, Spanish is really useful. <laughs> Not um, only for Spain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so that um, was all the qu uh, questions that we received in the chat. Uh, we have two minutes left. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, last very short question might be. If not, then maybe we will go to uh, finalize. Mm -hmm. If I don't see any hands... Just will change the look now. So then, uh, one second. Pablo, Pablo is asking something here. I'm also interested in becoming a partner organization to someone. Can you please tell me it or share any link? <clears throat> That's very difficult because these are tenders, and it's not about grants, of course. And um, I don't know whether you have a company or if you have a you have an NGO, but. Uh, if you see something, I have an that... NGO opened in two thousand and two. Yeah, yeah. Already, to, uh, already twenty one year. Yeah, depending depending on the the expertise, the companies that usually the 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 leading company of the of the consortium is searching for uh, other companies to um, be a part of the consortium, and uh, this very much depends on them. And uh, depends on the requirements of the of the call, of the ten of the terms of reference, whether they would actually even collaborate with a with an NGO or not. I have seen collaboration with NGOs, but um, and that happens from time to time. Also with smaller ones, I don't know how big or small your organization is. Nevertheless, um, that is based on different, uh, let's say. Um, yeah, what what the the organization or the company can actually bring as a benefit to the consortium, be it financially or by expertise. So these two things are necessary. But I cannot give you a link where you can find partners. It's is uh, really really depending on on if you hear something, then you may get into that. Uh, get in touch with them and then say, okay, are you looking for partners? Okay, thank you. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Behrus. I think it was very practical webinar with a lot of practical tips <laughs> that uh, we can use right away. Uh, thank you so much, Behrus, that you agreed and you come to us. Great. Of course. My <laughs> pleasure. And that was... Uh, Anyway, I'm a little bit of a part of the guild. I mean, I should, uh, I'm guilty for it. <laughs> <laughs> so you feel guilty. <laughs> <As well. laughs> thank you. And thank you for all of us who came here. Just to remind you, that was a webinar that is in the frame of the Key Action 2 project supported by the German National Agency Holistic Trainer.